Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you and worship the Lord with you on this wonderful Sunday. Um, thank you, Andrew, and everyone else involved in the service, uh, the folks in the technology at the back, and uh, all of you for uh, coming and worshiping the Lord with your heart, with your presence, uh, online and in person. Um, Andrew asked me to introduce myself briefly. Uh, Sam Strauss, my name. I grew up mostly in Kitchener, uh, as far as my childhood years. Um, grew up at the Martin Luther Church, uh, where my dad uh, and mom had the pastoral role there, and um, then uh, went on in 98 to Germany to study theology there. And that's uh, in that phase of my life is when uh, Anne and I uh, met and joined together. Then we married in 2002. And in 2004, we went to Bangladesh with Liebenzell Mission, where we served uh, basically until 2020, when uh, we had decided that we would need to come back. God gave us three kids in those years. Uh, two of them were born in Bangladesh, so a lot of our life and uh, our uh, ministry experience sort of comes from that South Asian context, not even so much from the Western uh, and North American side. So uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you'll notice that, maybe not. Uh, as I speak, I feel like as we've just come back to, or I've just come back to Canada last year, and for the whole family that's new, um, that kind of makes us an immigrant family. Um, even though maybe my language, my English doesn't convey that, but on the whole, uh, it's probably best to treat us like a regular immigrant family that has to find its way in a new country in Canada, and maybe some of even uh, our folks here right now, uh, not only the older folks, uh, may have experienced having come from another country and uh, made a transition, and uh, that's not easy. And so we'd appreciate, too, that you would pray for us and pray for Liebenzell Mission as we serve there. Um, in particular, my ministry, uh, along with Anne, is to be uh, teaching missionary candidates that are preparing to go abroad. That's a major aspect of what we're doing, mostly in Toronto, um, and also uh, other aspects of ministry in the pastoral area with Liebenzell Canada. Just sort of a, a brief introduction. So nice to meet you. Some faces I recognize, that's nice. Uh, and uh, I do hope that what God's put on my heart uh, today uh, would resonate with you and um, connect with where you're at in your experience with this amazing creator that we were presented with. Thank you, Andrew, that you had us or follow through with that whole 104th Psalm, an amazing display of God's power. There's hardly any bit of creation that isn't mentioned in there, uh, and how God rejoices in sustaining what he made. It's not just an alarm clock that maybe the old analog type where you wind it up, and then you set it down, and you just let it tick its way on until the life pitters out. That's not God's model. What he's made, he loves to sustain. And what's turned from him, he loves to draw back to himself. That's how he is. That's the gospel message. That's the whole point, it seems, of what God has done in presenting himself in his living word to reach out to his people. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus came. That's why he spoke words of life to people he met, and they were recorded, and you have them in your hands, maybe, or we see them on the screen. You have God's word printed to remind us these stories aren't just some fanciful uh, creations of, of some creative people. This is words of life. And what we want to look at today is one of those words of the living God, of Jesus himself, in maybe one of the most well-known, maybe the most well-known sermon that he preached, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 to 7. So if I can ask... Uh, the, the brothers, you can just feel free to 
click through those three text slides on that text as you uh, find uh, appropriate. Uh, I want to just sort of go through what we read there in the New Testament scripture, Matthew 6, 25 to 34, and, uh, and read a little bit uh, or, or, or share a little bit about some of those aspects. I will read it again just so that we have it uh, in mind. Therefore, I tell you, um, Jesus says, do not worry about your life. We could stop right there. I won't, but that's the gist of our sermon today. Don't worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What do you worry about? Or are you one of those rare human beings that is immune to worry? Steady like a rock. Do you worry about things? Can you put up a hand if you admit you worry sometimes? There's plenty to worry about, isn't there? I just let my mind run a little. I'll tell you some of the things I found. I presume you're probably not confident enough to shout out your worries right here and now. So I'll plop a few into the midst of our time here. Jesus talks about life and body, about food, clothes, and those things. But there's so much that can creep up on us, right? Take health, for example. We need it, but we can't just dictate it to our bodies. We don't hold it in our hands. Sickness can come any moment. We can worry about our aging parents. Even our own aging selves. My body doesn't tick like it used to. The other. I realized that just at a water park in, uh, outside of Montreal last week. We visited my brother. I thought I could go shooting down the water slide just like the old days. So I grabbed the wood board and wanted to launch myself feet first through. And you know what happened? I went bonk and landed on my backside and really hurt my tailbone. And I wasn't going down the slide yet. I just sat there, hurt. I'm getting old. I don't have all the gray hair, but I'm getting old too. We all are. And these worries about aging can grab us at any moment. Money, debt, lingering headaches, inflation. We worry about maybe establishing a family, about wanting children and not getting them. Maybe we worry about our loved ones. How those that we've prayed for still haven't come to faith and we 
desire that for them. We worry about people slandering us, being unfair to us at work. I was over in Germany a few months ago. Uh, The worries of the war in Ukraine and the gas problems, the food shortages, the headache that a war over here causes over in Africa. Unbelievable connections we're in in this world. It's so easy to let your mind wander and worry. And it, it's not ridiculous. It's not like some crazy tale. These are real problems. Environmental disasters, heat rising, prices going up. Maybe we even worry about mistakes we made in our past. That some old stories come up and show their ugly face. Things that maybe weren't dealt with. Maybe we worry about our wayward kids. Maybe you're in responsibility, even for this church, and you worry about the health and growth of the church. Retirement. Will it be enough? The unpredictability of our times. The end times. Safety. So much. And at any moment in our week, in our day, maybe when we're a little down or we don't have our guard up or I don't know what it is, these worries can creep in like water in a crack and it will find its way to this point inside of us that starts to influence us, starts to grip us. Worry. Worry is like a good rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you're not getting anywhere. Right? You're not really getting anywhere. Clearly, this topic of worrying is important to Jesus, the Master. He spends quite a bit of time on it. And it's in the middle of these three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount, sort of like a manifesto of Jesus describing his kingdom, describing his kingdom people. He starts out the sermon with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's chapter 5. And chapter 7 ends with, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus, and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house, that means his life, on the rock on his words. Building our lives on his word. That's the key here. Luther once says, whoever doesn't have God's word must resort to their own thoughts. Whoever doesn't have cement must build with dirt. Either we accept that the God who claims he's made you and loves you and is willing to give his life for you also wants to sustain you and invite you into that relationship of trust or all we have left are our own thoughts, our own wisdom to build our lives on. Isn't it interesting? I did a rough, quick calculation 10% of this Sermon on the Mount is about this part of worrying. 10% of Jesus' sermon was worthy of him to address it like this. Why 10%? I think Jesus knows and knew that we all struggle with worrying, with anxiety, with, with 
thoughts that drive us that aren't always so easy to corral. Worrying is a big part of our human existence. It's true. I don't think we need to just feel guilty about that right now. But to acknowledge it affects us. It's a part of our story. So I kind of wondered how does Jesus address this and maybe what can we glean from these few verses, especially Matthew 25, uh, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. What can we pick out of there? I've got a number of points that I kind of want to highlight and maybe some of them resonate with you. The first thing I want to highlight is that we need to realize or that we are invited to realize worrying doesn't really help. Our passage says so in verse 27. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Or the paraphrase from Eugene Peterson says it slightly different. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much of a difference? His paraphrase goes on. It doesn't really help. Maybe that's good to take a step back and realize that. It doesn't change one iota. What else? I think it's good to practice to listen if we realize we're struggling with worries. Listen. Jesus starts with, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Jesus claims, by opening his mouth at all about the topic, that he's got something to say. He can speak with authority into our lives. He's got something good to say. So the question is, are we listening? He's trying to tell us, are we listening? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. That's an order. You know, the ultimate truths the ones that really matter in life, they aren't the ones we dream up for ourselves that are based on our own reason and intellect. They're the words of truth spoken to us from the Eternal One. We are desperate for words of life from outside of us, spoken in. That's how the gospel works. Not tapping on our wisdom and taking our perfection to the next level. So the question is, can we give God's word a chance to permeate our thinking, to address our approach, how we tackle every day and the challenges we face, the relationships we're in? God's word wants to help orient us in a confusing world. And so God's word wants to have a voice in your life and in mine. Therefore, I tell you. So listen. But listen and be receptive for God's speaking. You know, worries kind of make unreceptive. Worries kind of curl us up like a drying leaf and make us worried about us, about our safety. It's about me. The clock ticks because of me. Right? You don't have to admit it. Worries make us unreceptive. Do you remember that story of the or that parable that Jesus tells about the four uh, aspects or, or kinds of field where the sower set, sows seed and Jesus explains that what's being sown is his word that wants to bear fruit, that wants to take root. And so he describes the four fields and only one of them really is good and receptive. Three of them aren't. 
And he says something interesting about worries in that passage. The one who received the seed, that is the gospel message of the kingdom, and that fell among thorns is the person who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the seed, making it unfruitful. Worries comes up in that context. Worries can apparently make us unreceptive to him who wants to speak words of life to us. Maybe that's good for us to reflect. Are, are my cycling thoughts, my anxiety about life and the future and my safety, is that becoming such a driving uh, current that I am unable to really hear what Jesus wants to say to me? What else? I think Jesus is commanding us to enjoy nature. Notice Jesus actually commands the people of God to get out. Look at the birds, he says. Get out. Look at the birds. They're not in here. They're out there. See how the flowers grow. Care about what I made. Read Psalm 104 and let your jaw drop in amazement. That's me at work. Jesus makes a stunning argument here. The logic is, I made it. I'm sustaining it. Get with the program. That's my job. I'm good at it. Did a little check on the birds of our good earth. I was looking into, I just asked myself the question since Jesus talks about it, how many birds are there? I don't know if you've read about this or something. So apparently there are like real bird lovers that do this very well. They observe what birds, what species are about where and when in the year and so on. And thousands of ornithologists, bird scientists, contributed together, and somehow it was coordinated by this National Academy of Sciences, and they did a rough estimate of how many birds there are on our good planet. And they came up with the number 50 billion individual birds. That's like six birds to one human. And God feeds them all, is the message. God feeds them all. In his way, he takes care of them. That's amazing. And of course, the logic that Jesus is applying here is, don't you think I can take care of you? Don't you think I care about you? And so I think this text of Jesus is also an invitation to pray and to trust him because the Almighty knows our need. To talk to him, to seek his guidance and perspective on the challenges of life. In a sense, to worry inordinately about the necessities of life, that's a call to confess our unbelief that God really will take care of me, of my family, of my loved ones. To not pray to him shows a lack of trust. To not appeal to him who gives life and sustains it, that shows that, well, frankly, we don't care about him. Just a few verses before our text, Jesus teaches his friends to pray. And he introduces them to the prayer that we already prayed a few moments ago, the Lord's Prayer. And how does it start? Shout it out. What's the first words? Our Father in heaven. 
Have you ever wondered why doesn't it say my father in heaven? Jesus decided to teach his friends how to pray and he taught them the prayer by saying my father in heaven. He didn't. The whole context is a bunch of Jesus' friends sitting at this mountain and he's speaking to them the words of the kingdom. And he addresses them as a fellowship and invites them to pray with our Father. I believe this word our in this sermon is important. I think it's also relevant for the topic of worries. Because we need fellowship. We need brothers and sisters who love the Lord and have responded to his love to then come alongside us and be a help, a support, and a corrective. We need people to come alongside us. So that invitation to pray together and to be in a context of fellowship with one another, that, I believe, is a support for us in our constant challenge of dealing with worries, with anxiety. We need that corrective. We were never meant and built for living a life of faith all by our lonesome. Plowing through this world with our solitary bravery. We were always meant for fellowship, to be also dependent on others, to love them and be a minister to them. And so that's why I think it's also a, val a, a valid point to consider that Jesus basically asks us to apply our minds in the topic of worrying and to do that together. Apply your mind, your intellect, your reason. Use your head. Think, reflect. Why do I say that? I think Jesus is telling us to analyze and to look. What is it? that you really see. When Jesus says, if God is like that with the flower, won't he clothe you? He's asking you to think this through with him in his help, in his, on the basis of his word. It's not a rhetorical trick. It's an invitation to use the gift of our minds to think through and struggle through what we're facing and to constantly work for a steady, a, a balanced perspective. And sometimes what worries me doesn't worry my brother or my sister so much. And so they can help me gain perspective again. I think it's an important distinction, the one between worry and concern makes sense to me. Worry is more of a form of self-torment, best described as what-if thinking. Concern, on the other hand, is a calculated consideration, an assessment of actual danger. I think we are called to be concerned about many things in our own lives and in our world, but to not let it twist into a cycle of worrying that debilitates us and takes our, st our strength and our joy. Worrying anticipates the problems and assumes that things are going to go awry. If we maybe pause for a moment from the words of Jesus and have a look at our world, how have they thought about the topic of worrying? Well, Cornell University did a whole study just on worrying. And the study showed that 85% of worries never actually happen. Never come to pass. So the math alone 
should actually tell us, take a step back from these thoughts that are paralyzing you. If you don't take Jesus' word for it, take Cornell University's word for it, is what they're saying. I'm not saying that. But what about the 15%, we would say? We're worried that those come up and show their ugly head. Well, of the 15% that do come to pass, it turns out 79% of those turn out to actually be helpful, that they learned something from this challenge that they were so worried about. It wasn't so bad, or that they could master it. That leaves only about 3% of the things that we worry about, that we say to ourselves day after day, that we tell our neighbors about, oh, this and that. Only 3% actually come to pass. So we spend a lot of time on probably not the best things. I do notice in the words of Jesus that I think he does say to us, you still have to do your part. It's not just lean back, let life happen, God will figure it out for you. What does he say about the birds? He says about the birds of the air that they don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet the Father feeds them. I believe linguistically that means definitely sow, definitely reap, and definitely build barns and prepare. Plan ahead. Do your part. Be faithful in your work. And Christians and the New Testament brings it up in all kinds of places. Christians are called to be faithful in their, in their hard work. To give it their best. To work at their skills. To hone them. I think every human, human should do that. I hope every parent teaches that to their child. But if we don't do it naturally, do it on the basis of God's word. Paul says, we urge you, warn those who are idle. In 1 Thessalonians 5. Or in the chapter before, he writes, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with the hands just as we told you. So do your part. Don't worry. God's got your back. But do your part too. I think that's helpful. I think that's realistic. That's the head screwed on straight. I also find it interesting that I think Jesus says here, tackle today. Don't try and tackle all of the future's problems this afternoon. I think that's how we can also begin to worry less, by just focusing on the things that are in front of us and not cycling through everything over and over about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. I find that line of Jesus actually quite humorous that he says that. Don't worry about tomorrow, tomorrow will worry about itself. That's actually hilarious. If you take a step back. Jesus has humor. And he invites us to laugh to rejoice, and to see the humorous things. Each day has trouble of its own. So tackle today. And sometimes our life challenges seem to overwhelm us, and that's all we can do. I have heard that phrase from my mom very often as her age increases. I just ask God to help me through this day. There's wisdom in that. I got two more points that I want to share. You know, I looked up your website here at CFC just to see a little bit of what you have here, what you do, what you stand for, what you love. And I found a phrase, not, I didn't find that much, but one phrase I uh, found interesting on the website. Uh, it said, uh, we take God seriously here at CFC. 
What is important to God is important to us. This includes you. We would love to meet you Sunday morning, it said on the website. So, whoever is in responsibility here of the, at the church, you've made a statement publicly. You care about fellowship. You care about investing in other people's lives. You want to prioritize that. And so you want to be living fellowship in community. You want to do that together. I think that's really important. And I believe that is a, an important aspect to equipping one another with calming and clear and helpful guidance from others that are on this path of faith with us, that are looking to follow Christ with their lives. I needed a word like that. I've got, just got two points left, but I needed a point like that recently. I just shared at the beginning that we're an immigrant family. You know, we have all kinds of paperwork to do. We, I used to be a permanent resident, but I lost that through the service in Bangladesh. Now we're starting the process all over again. And just while I was preparing this two weeks ago, the whole questions and the complexity of the permanent residency application and all of that just started to billow up and I was wondering how are we ever going to get any of this through? This is like a lottery win. And there I was preparing something on the topic of worrying and I felt that, that tightness in my chest and this concern, God, are you going to come through? And there was a man that I was talking to, and he asked me some good questions about this, just to come back to that topic of fellowship. And through the conversation with him in a couple days, I realized I was kind of being unfair to God. I was making my love for him conditional on him getting this paperwork stuff through. I will love you, but you got to do this for us. Do you see the problem with that? And then this guy I was talking to, that's what this point is about, fellowship, community, he said, Sam, that's not right. That's a problem. He helped me see it. And I could confess it with him and I could pray and thank Jesus that he's bigger than that and he's worthy of my love no matter what happens. But that's fellowship helping me, coming alongside me, challenging me in the midst of my puddle of worry. We need that. If you're not anchored in that kind of a fellowship, like it says on the website here, where we want to do the things that are important to God, we want those to be important to us, then question yourself. Question how you're living that fellowship and invest in those relationships. Jesus says, for the pagans, the last two verses, they run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And again, all these things will be added unto you. The pagans, they run after all these things. But your Father in heaven knows it. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added. We have the same basic biological needs. We all need a roof over our heads. We need food in our bellies. We need clothes on our bodies. Protect us from the weather. That's all true. But if that's the goal of your life, then you've missed something, Jesus is saying. I got so much more in store for you. Focus on my priorities, and it will go well with your soul. Folks, this, this sermon, just these few verses, are a real loving invitation by Jesus to come to him. To trust him with your whole big, ugly bag of worries. You know the verse... Cast all your cares upon him. 
That's the invitation. Plop that bag in front of him. It's not just going to go away all of a sudden. But you're reminding yourself he's in this with you. And that he's worthy of your devotion. And he's faithful. He will carry you. So my last point is take that step. Rely on Jesus. Tell it to him again. Rely on Jesus' promise to provide. In a sense, this passage is an invitation to take his hand. To take, wager that step of faith. It's an invitation to everyone trying to build their life's foundation solely on the dust of their own mental powers. But instead to take that cement of God's word and build solidly with something that lasts both now and in eternity. God's word, God himself, is worthy of that kind of a response of love, of faith, from people that worry. May God help you. May God care for you. And if he does help you in amazing ways, that your mouth would be released to share that with others. That some of that joy would be infectious and that you would come back to these points and say to the people around you, your neighbors, your loved ones, this is how my faithful God took care of me. Hallelujah. That's all I've got today. I'd like to pray. I'd like to just take maybe 30 seconds of quiet. Maybe that would be appropriate for you too to say to your God who made you, who loves you, and who has great thoughts for you and your life, great ways that you haven't even explored how he wants to use you, that you could respond to him, the sustainer of life. our faithful creator and lover of our souls. We praise you for your glory and your majesty, your ability to follow through on your promises, for your joy in sustaining life. Thank you that although you love the birds and the flowers you made beautiful, you make clear you really deeply care about us. Help us to risk that trust, to take that step, to drop the bag of worries at your feet and to trust you like a loving father who can fix a child's toy, that you would be there and you would help us, that you'd take that worry crease off our forehead. Lord, I pray for the folks here at this church that you would meet them in their need and ours in our family that you would meet us in those places that are very unique to each one of us but you know you're the father who says you know our needs so i pray that you would in this coming week give us some experience some examples of how you've proven your faithfulness may you carry us may you give us wisdom to respond you us to use our mind to invest in fellowship and to be the people that you've called us to be we thank you that you are the living god amen 
I've been asked to close this part of our sermon with the benediction, and I won't do the classic blessing, but words from this Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you stand. Is that appropriate? Maybe let's do that. Let's just stand before our Father in heaven. And I repeat two words of blessing that begin the Sermon on the Mount from which our text came, where Jesus says to those people then and to us now, blessed are the poor, the needy in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, they will be taken care of. May you go under the care of our living Lord. Amen.